Today I want to speak about one of the greatest journeys in the history of Islam. And that is the journey of Umar ibn Khattab anhu going to Jerusalem to pick up the keys from the patriarch. But there are certain portions within the earth which are better than others. The most holiest is the Haram in Mecca. Interestingly, since the Muslims went to Mecca, Fateh Mecca, returned to Mecca, uncontested, it has been in the hands of the Muslims. Medina, second most holiest place. Since the Muslims went into Medina and they created their constitution, Medina has for the last 1400 years been uncontestedly in the hands of the Muslims. Then we go to the third most holiest place to the believers. There is no place on the face of this earth which is as contested as Jerusalem. And really to understand today's conflict, you have to look into history. The longest battle in the history of humanity is the Crusades. Crusades lasted for 200 years. You know how many Christians died in the Crusades? These weren't people who lived over there. No, these, the vast majority of these people were people who traveled from the west, from here, all the way to the east. No planes, no ships. Vast majority of them either walked or they went on a mount. Six million Christians died. It is regarded as the longest battle in the history of humanity recorded. And then we had Salahuddin Rahimahullah, the king who stayed more in his tent than he stayed in his palace. And he liberated Masjid al-Aqsa. He liberated Jerusalem 80 years after the demise of Salahuddin. His own family, the Ayyubites, Yusuf and Nasir were drawing deals with the Christians and saying to the Christians, I will give you Jerusalem back. On one condition that you help us fight the Mamluks in Egypt and we will give you Masjid al-Aqsa and everything with it. Mongols, you know the history of the Mongols? They decimated the Muslim world. Even the Mongols were cutting deals with the Christians and saying, that if you help us fight the Muslims, we will give you Jerusalem. 1492 is the year where the Muslims lost Granada, the final place in Andalus. After 800 years of ruling, now the Muslims had to give the keys back to the Alhambra palace, that beautiful palace in Granada. At times being the most powerful force on the face of this earth, the Muslims in, in, in Andalus. You know when Abu Abdullah gave the key back to Isabella and Ferdinand, you know who was there? 1st of January 1492 after 800 years of dominance, Christopher Columbus was there. It was at the end of 1492 that Christopher Columbus reached the Americas. Same year, with the help of Muslim and Jewish navigators. The next year, 1493, Christopher Columbus wrote a letter to Isabella and Ferdinand, and he said, give me five years and I will bring an army to you, which will comprise of 50,000 infantry, and 5,000 cavalry with what purpose? He says one purpose and that purpose is to liberate Jerusalem. Even Christopher Columbus had his eyes on Jerusalem. Have you ever heard of a man called Imam Shamil? Imam Shamil is known as the Salahuddin of the Caucasus because Nicholas Tsar wanted to take 
the Caucasus. So from Russia, he was the most powerful, possibly most powerful man on the face of this earth. He wanted to, from here, from Russia, he wanted to take Jerusalem. But the problem was that he had to go past the Caucasus. For over 20 years, Imam Shamil, rahimahullah, he couldn't get past the Caucasus, let alone Jerusalem. And this is why Imam Shamil rahimahullah is known as the Salahuddin of the Caucasus. This is just a small portion of history regarding Masjid al-Aqsa. So if you understand this, then you understand the context of what is happening today. This is the most contested place on the face of this earth. Let me tell you about another ajeeb incident in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam Bukhari mentions this in Kitabul Iman. Heraclius was the leader of the Byzantine, the Eastern Europeans. And Heraclius came to Jerusalem for a pilgrimage. This was his, you know, this was his defining moment because he had just defeated the Persians. He was elated. He had bought the true cross just to leave. This was the most holiest relic. Just to leave that in Jerusalem, he came for this pilgrimage. Whilst he's in Jerusalem, he has a dream. Imam Bukhari mentioned this, Ajib. He says he has a dream that he sees through the stars because he's an astrologer, that a day will come that a group of people will take this land. So he wakes up very uncomfortable, very perturbed. So they ask him what's wrong and he says, I've had this dream and I couldn't get to sleep after that. It hasn't combed his hair, it looks real mess. He said, one sign of these people is that they are people who have been sized. At that very time, the Prophet ﷺ sent out the letters to the leaders to invite them towards Islam. And he receives the letter of the Prophet ﷺ inviting him towards Islam. So he says, who is this man? They said, oh, he's a man who lives in the Arab Peninsula and he regards himself as a prophet. Now he's intrigued. So he said, is there any of his people in Jerusalem? La ilaha illallah. At that very time, Abu Sufyan happened to be in Jerusalem. Abu Sufyan was the leader of Quraysh in every single battle against the Muslims. Abu Sufyan was in charge of the army besides one battle, and that was the battle of Badr. And why wasn't he in charge of that? Because he was in charge of the caravan which the Muslims were trying to intercept. So therefore he couldn't be a part. Every other battle he's in charge. So Heraclius calls him and he calls the entire caravan. And he says, who is the closest in family to this man, Muhammad? So Abu Sufyan says, I am. So he says, so you come forward. And he says to the rest of his caravan, he says, if he lies, you just indicate to me he's lied. Abu Sufyan says, by Allah, if it was not for the sake that people would have called me a liar, I would have lied regarding Muhammad. That's how much he hated the Prophet sallallahu so Heraclius now says, he's asking him a, a number of questions. He tells the translator, he said, ask him, this man, what kind of family does he belong to? He said, he belongs to a very noble family. He said, I want to ask you, did any of his forefathers regard themselves as kings? He said, no. He said, did any of his forefathers claim that they were prophets? He said, no. He said, I want to ask you, what kind of people follow him? The high, the noble or the untouchables? The poor, the masakin, the slaves. He said, the untouchables. He said, I want to ask you, do their numbers increase or do their numbers decrease? He said, their numbers increase. He said, do any of them turn away from the religion after they have embraced the religion? He said, no, none of them ever turn away from religion. I want to ask you, did he lie before prophethood? He said, no. He said, has he ever broken his prophet before prophethood? He said, no. Now Abu Sufyan says, here I had got a chance because this was after Sulul Hudaybiyah. And I said to him, he said, I, I got a chance to slip what I wanted to say. I said, he's never broken his promise, but because we now have a treaty, he may break his promise now. He said to him, do you have wars? He said, yes. He said, who wins the wars? He said, sometimes we win the wars, sometimes they win the wars. He said, what does he command you to do? He said, he commands us 
to worship Allah and do not prescribe partners unto him. He, he tells us to pray. He tells us to forsake the religion of our forefathers. He tells us that we should be chaste, we should be good to our neighbors. So then Heracli says to the translator, translate for him. Heracli says, I ask you, what kind of family he comes from? You said he comes from a noble family. He said, every single Nabi come from a noble family. I ask you, did any of his forefathers claim that they were prophets or kings? You said no. I would have said possibly if he claimed himself as a prophet because his forefathers claimed they were prophets, he just wanted to claim the stake of his forefathers. He just wanted to be a king or a prophet like his forefathers. You said no. I ask you, what kind of people follow him? You said those people who are poor follow him, the untouchable. He said every Nabi, listen to this, every single Nabi is initially followed by poor people, the untouchables. The rich are not interested. Why? Because they're too good. They're always followed by the poor people. He said, I ask you, do their numbers increase or decrease? You said their numbers increase. He said, that is the nature of Iman. He said, I ask you, do anybody turn away from the religion after they have embraced the religion? You said, none of them ever turn away from the religion. He said, when the sweetness of Iman enters the heart, nobody ever turns away from it. I ask you, did this man lie or break his promises before prophethood? You said no. Then I want to ask you a question. If a man was not ready to lie to other people, why would he lie about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I ask you about wars. You said sometimes they win, sometimes we win. He said that's how it happens. I ask you about what does he command you to do and you told me this is what he commands you to do. He said every Nabi comes with this very dawah that you worship Allah and do not prescribe partners unto him. That you pray, you be chaste, etc, etc. And then Heraclius said, he said, by Allah, if you are speaking the truth, then a day will come that this very place where I stand today, this man Muhammad will conquer that which is beneath my feet. Abu Sufyan says that the leader of Bani Asfar Bani Asfar were the yellow one, because they referred to the Europeans as the yellow one. He said, the leader of Bani Asfar is even impressed by this man Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Within the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the message of Allah told about a day that the Muslims would take Masjid al-Aqsa. And this is a miracle of the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away and nothing happened. Abu Bakr becomes the Khalif. Nothing happens. Then, in the time of Umar ibn Khattab anhu, you have a very famous battle, the Battle of Yarmouk, which was Khalid bin Walid against the Byzantines. So in the Battle of Yarmouk, the Muslims, they defeat the Byzantines. Abu Ubaidat ibn Jarrah anhu, who was the commander, the general of this army, sends a letter to Umar ibn Khattab anhu, who was in Medina and he says to Imam al Mu'minin, what shall we do next? Where should we go? So Umar radiallahu anhu says, go to Al-Aqsa, go to Al-Quds, go to Jerusalem. Then Abu Baydat ibn Jarrah radiallahu anhu replies and he says, O Amir al Mu'minin, there is one issue and the issue is that Al-Quds the man who is in charge of Al-Quds is a man called Artaboon. And nobody can take Al-Quds Al uh, because Artaboon was known for his intelligence. So Umar ibn Khattab anhu now writes him a letter and he says to him, We will strike the Artaboon of the Romans with the Artaboon of the Arabs. Send him Amr ibn As. Him and Khalid bin Walid Radiallahu anhum both embraced Islam on the same day. So Abu Baydat ibn Jarrah radiallahu anhu now sends an army with Amr ibn As in charge. And Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu goes to Al Quds and he lays siege to Al Quds. So he sends a messenger. Messenger comes back. He's not very happy. Sends another, sends another, sends another. Every time he sends a messenger, he's outwitted by Artaboon. 
So Amr ibn As anhu goes, pretending he's a messenger, he meets Artaboon. Artaboon is now impressed by this messenger. So he goes back to his council and he says to his council, you know, this guy, he doesn't seem like a messenger. He said, I've spoken to thousands of messengers in my life. This guy is a leader because he talks like a leader. And if I am not wrong, this is Amr himself. So what shall we do? So what we will do is we will allow him to leave Jerusalem and then we will strike him with an arrow. And when he struck with the arrow, we will say it was a straight arrow. We don't know who shot it and he died. So Amr ibn As is now going back to the gates of Jerusalem to leave. One of the Arabs who knew what was happening wasn't a Muslim. He says to Amr ibn As, he says, Amr, you came in a very good manner. Leave in a very good manner. Now, Amr was very, very sharp. He realized that there is something going on. When he reaches the gates, he says to the soldier, he says, you know what? Maybe I can quash this problem. Allow me to go back and speak to him. And I can maybe resolve this issue. And then there will be no blood, bloodshed. So he goes back to speak to Artaboon. When he reaches Artaboon, he says to Artaboon, he said, Artaboon, were you impressed by me? He said, yes, you're a very intelligent person. He said, tomorrow I will bring you another nine who are as intelligent as me and we will discuss the issue and we will convince you that you should hand over Jerusalem to us. So Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu leaves, a day passes, a couple of days pass and then Artaboon is waiting for him and then he sends him a letter. He said, when are you coming back? He said, I ain't coming back. Now, by this time, Abu Bayt al Jarrah has come with his uh, regiment. Khalid bin Walid has come, Sharahmil ibn Hasna. So you have three major regiments there who defeated the Byzantines in the Battle of Yarmouk. Artaboon manages to sneak out. So he leaves the patriarch in charge. Now, the patriarch says that he will give over Al Qud, Jerusalem, but he will only give it to Umar ibn Khattab. Nobody else. Now, the ulama say, why? Why would he only give it to Umar ibn Khattab? Some say that they had the signs of the conqueror of Jerusalem in their books, and those signs indicated to Umar ibn Khattab. Personally, I believe the strongest opinion is that they knew about the justice of Umar ibn Khattab. So he sends a letter to Abu Baida and he said, we will give the keys only to Umar ibn Khattab. Now, Umar is in Medina. Abu Baidat ibn Jarrah sends a letter to Umar in Medina, but with that letter go a delegation of Christians. So imagine this. They're going to meet the most powerful man on the face of this earth. So they go, they look for the house of Umar ibn Khattab. They find this little house, but he's not there. Then they go into the masjid of the Prophet wasallam. And Umar is not in the masjid either. So they ask around and some people said, well, we saw him over there. He was sitting down on, on, on a mat. He was sitting all by himself. And the Christians are marveling because they're used to pomp and glory. And you have this man who is the most powerful man on the face of this earth. And he's sitting all by himself. So Umar reads the letter, he says to them, I will do mashwara, you go back and I will let you know. Some of them say, go. Some of them say, don't go. But Umar was going. Because the Prophet Sallallahu said, he said, pray two rakats in Masjid Al-Aqsa. And if you cannot pray two rakats in Masjid Al-Aqsa, then send oil to be burnt in the lantern. This was a mu'jizah, a miracle of the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because at that time, the Masjid al-Aqsa wasn't even in the hands of the Muslims. So here, Umar anhu could possibly be the man who fulfills the prophecy of the Prophet ﷺ. So Umar anhu now decides to go. So Umar anhu leaves. And this is amazing. Waqidi mentioned this story. It's amazing. He leaves with what? Just one khadim. Just one other individual. And they have two mounts, two rides. One is a more superior one and one is not as good as the 
the former. So when they're going on this journey, they reach this village, this area, so they meet the people in the area, and because Islam had just spread newly, people are not that educated. So when he's in this village, they tell him about a man, old man, who is not old enough now to graze his flock. So he has hired another younger man to graze his flock, and his way of payment to this young man is that he allows him to have a relationship with his wife. So Umar calls him, and he says, do you actually know this is haram? And he says, no. He said, I will let you off this time, do it again and I will have your neck. Then he goes further up and he comes to another place and they tell him about a man who's married to two sisters. So Umar summons him and he says, you married to two sisters, the haram is mentioned in the Quran, you can't marry two sisters. He said, but Amir al-Mu'mineen, I love them. So Umar radiallahu said, you may love them, but it's haram in the deen, divorce one. Then Umar on the same journey, he goes further up and he comes by a place where he sees a group of non-Muslims. They're standing in the sun. They got these large pots on their head full of oil. And these Christians can't pay the jizya. Jizya is a tax that non-Muslims pay when they're living under Muslims. So Umar radiallahu says, so what if they can't pay the jizya? If they can't afford the jizya, why are you punishing them as a consequence? And Umar rebuked the governor. On another occasion, Umar radiallahu anhu, he saw an old Jewish man begging. And he called the governor and he said, why is this old man begging? All his life he has paid taxes to us. Now he can no longer fend for himself. You are making him beg. Umar, every child, imagine this, 1400 years ago, every child which was born in the Muslim world was given an allowance the day the child was born. So Umar now, he leaves here, he goes to a place called Jabiya. In Jabiya, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu come to visit Umar radiallahu anhu. So yeah, Sharahbi ibn Hassana. Abu Baydat ibn Jarrah, Khalid ibn Walid. Now, Abu Baydat ibn Jarrah was a very simple person. Shirahbil and Khalid are not dressed up. They had these nice, expensive robes. So Umar radiallahu anhu gets off his mount and he picks up, he picks up a rock and he throws it at them. He said, even after a hundred years, you dress like this, I would not spare you. It's only been two two years. So then they take off their robe and they've got their armor underneath it and then Umar radiallahu cools down. So he says to Abu Ubaidah, he says, Abu Ubaidah, take me to your house. So Abu Ubaidah says, oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, why do you want to come to my house for? The only thing which is going to happen if you come to my house is that you're going to rinse out your eyes. And Umar says, no, take me to your house. So he goes, he looks around the home. And there's hardly any provisions in the house of Abu Baidah al Jarrah. And Abu Baidah radiallahu anh, brings him some water and a few crumbs. And Umar looks at them. And Umar radiallahu anh, says, Don't you have anything besides this? And Abu Baidah says, O oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, it's enough to get me to the other side. And Umar radiallahu anh, begins to cry. He said, The dunya has changed all of us beside you, Abu Baidah. And Umar is now crying, and Abu Baidah radiallahu anhu says to him, he says, oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, I told you don't come to my house, because the only thing which is going to happen is that you're going to rinse out your eyes. And then it was time to go and meet the patriarch. The patriarch said that he would only give the key to Umar radiallahu anhu, and he would give it to nobody besides Umar radiallahu anhu. So now Umar radiallahu anhu, decides to leave for Al-Aqsa. He had traveled all the way from Medina wearing these clothes which had 17 patches on. So it's time to meet the patriarch. So the other Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, O Amir al-Mu'mineen, you come from so far, all the way from Medina, and these people, they have a pomp and lavish lifestyle, what we don't want to happen is that all your travel has been wasted because they see you and they say, this is not a leader. 
So they say, Omir oh, al-Mu'mineen, for why don't you just for the meeting change your clothes and then after the meeting you can go back to your old clothes. So the narration, in some narrations, it's mentioned that Umar radiallahu anhu now went into the tent. He took off his old clothes with 17 patches and now he wore these new clothes. So he comes out of the tent, he takes a few steps and he turns to the Sahaba radiallahu anhu and he said, remember that there was a time that we were a base nation that we were nobodies then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored us through Islam where will we be if we leave the teachings of Islam the narration mentioned that Umar radiallahu anhu went back into the tent he took off his new clothes and wore his clothes which had 17 patches and then he went to meet the patriarch history remembers that man who had 17 patches on his clothes and history has forgotten those who wore pomp and lavish clothes because history remembers those people who are people of khair and good and he's going now with his khadim and they reach the outskirts of Jerusalem and everybody is waiting to see this man, Amir al Mu'min, Umar ibn Khattab, the most powerful man on the face of this earth. Just two people travel all the way from Medina, all the way to Jerusalem. So when they reach near Jerusalem, it's the turn of the Khadim to ride the nice mount. So Umar radiallahu anhu says, you ride this mount. And he said, Amir oh, al look, there's thousands of people out there waiting to meet you. They want to see you. They're not waiting for me. People will say, you the Khadim are riding the nice mount and the most powerful man on the face of this earth. Amir al Mu'mineen, Umar ibn Khattab is riding not a nice, such a nice mount. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, the turn is your turn. And then he said, honor is given to those who fulfill their promises. Thousands of people are waiting for him at the gates of Jerusalem. And Umar radiallahu anhu goes with the mount, which is an inferior mount. But the truth is that Umar remained Amir al-Mu'mineen and the Khadim remained the Khadim. It didn't make an iota difference. Why? Because see, Allah is the one who gives Izzah. Allah is the one who gives honor and Allah is the one who takes away honor. So then Umar radiallahu anhu, he reaches the walls of Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem is very interesting. Why? Because Jerusalem is very similar to how it was in the early times. Until today, you have the Babi Umar. Where Umar radiallahu anhu entered Jerusalem, you still have that door, it's still there. So the patriarch is now waiting for Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu and then him and Umar radiallahu anhu they have an agreement they, they create a pact and I'm going to read the pact for you it's a very famous pact it's one of the unique pacts because in that time religious freedom did not really exist the conquerors conquered and they did exactly what they wished and those who were conquered were subdued and they really had no rights. So Umar radiallahu anhu now he sits with the patriarch and they agree on this pact. So I will read the pact to you. Umar radiallahu anhu starts it in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. This is the assurance of safety which the servant of God, Umar the commander of the faithful has given to the people of Jerusalem. He has given them an insurance of safety for themselves, for their property, their churches, their crosses, the sick and the healthy of the city, and for all the rituals which belong to their religion. Their churches will not be inhabited by Muslims and will not be destroyed. Neither they nor the land on which they stand, nor their crosses, nor their property will be damaged. They will not be forcibly converted no Jew will live with them in Jerusalem now this was a condition which was placed 
by the Christians before they drew a pact with Umar ibn Khattab What Umar anhu did is that he allowed the Jews to come and visit where before the advent of Islam, before the Muslims conquered, they were not even allowed to visit Jerusalem. So Umar anhu said this, and then the treaty carries on. The people of Jerusalem must pay the tax, taxes like the people of other cities and must expel the Byzantines, those Romans who ruled, but the Christians could stay. Those of the people of Jerusalem who want to leave with the Byzantines, take their property and abandon their churches and crosses will be safe until they reach the places of refuge. So if anybody wanted to leave, you're free to leave. The villagers may remain in the city if they wish, but must pay taxes like the citizens. Those who wish may go with the Byzantines and those who wish may return to their families. Nothing is to be taken from them before the harvest is reaped. And then Umar who finishes the pact off, said if they pay their taxes according to their obligations, then the condition laid out in this letter are under the covenant of God, meaning we will regard it, we will fulfill it. And the responsibility of his prophet, of the caliphs and of the faithful. So this is the first covenant, the first pact. Really, this was very unique. Why was it very unique? Because until then, when you conquered a place, you did whatever you wanted. But Umar anhu actually gave them entire freedoms that they could keep their churches, that they could worship exactly how, how they wished, as long as they paid their taxes. This was signed by Khalid bin Walid, Amr ibn As, and Muawiyah and Abdurrahman ibn Awf. Anhu. The patriarch now gives the key to Umar radiallahu anhu. And then the patriarch begins to cry. So Umar radiallahu anhu says to the patriarch, what are you crying for? He said, this is how it works. Some, some days the upper hand is for you, some days the upper hand is for us. So the patriarch says, that's not why I'm crying. He said, I know one day we win, one day you win. But as long as the Muslims have a leader like you, they will never be defeated. And then Umar radiallahu anhu, he enters Al-Aqsa. You remember the prophecy of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Pray two rakats in Masjid Al-Aqsa. And if you cannot pray two rakats in Masjid Al-Aqsa, then at least send oil to be burnt in the lanterns of Masjid Al-Aqsa. At that time, Masjid Al-Aqsa was not even in the hands of the Muslims. So what did the Prophet ﷺ say? Pray two rakats in Masjid al-Aqsa. The first man in the history of Islam to pray two rakats in Masjid al-Aqsa was Umar ibn Khattab. He was the man who fulfilled the prophecy of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. In the first rakat, he prayed Surah al-Sad and did the sajda of Dawud because Dawud was in that vicinity. In the second rakat, Umar radiallahu anhu recited Surah Al-Isra where the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about taking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the Haram to Masjid Al-Aqsa. So Umar radiallahu anhu prays the two rakats and then Umar himself now he begins to clean the Masjid. Many of us believe that the dome of the rock is Masjid Al-Aqsa. No. The entire compound is Masjid Al-Aqsa. That's just a part of it. Now, this place, the Dome of the Rock, was the dirtiest place in Masjid Al-Aqsa. Why? Because the Christians believed that this was the place where they had sacrificed Isa alayhi salatu salam. So what they would do is that they made it a rubbish tip. So Umar radiallahu anhu now, he begins to clean it. So he starts cleaning it. The Sahaba radiallahu anhu see him cleaning it and they begin to assist him. And Umar radiallahu anhu takes all the rubbish from there. Then comes the time for salah, the first salah. So Umar radiallahu anhu looks around and who does he see? He says, Bilal. And he says, Oh Bilal, give the adhan. And Bilal radiallahu anhu says, Is Amir al Mu'mineen after the demise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? I don't give the adhan anymore. I can't bear to give the adhan. So Umar radiallahu anhu insists.
الجاد قد عظمت فللأمجاد بانيها So Bilal stands up and he says Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. The narration mentioned that those Sahaba who had embraced Islam and their beards were black and now had turned grey out of old age. Every single one of them were drenched with tears because it brought back the time of the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Umar radiallahu anhu cried so much that they had to console Amir al muminin Umar radiallahu anhu. So Umar radiallahu anhu now leads the Salah. Now imagine this. So he stands up, he says, straighten the safs. Khalid bin Walid is in the saf. Shrahbil ibn Hassana, Muadh ibn Jabal, Abaydat ibn Jarrah, and hundreds of other Sahaba radiallahu anhu. Can they be a nicer salah than this? Yes, I'll tell you about another nicer salah than this. When Bilal would give adhan in Medina, and then the Prophet sallallahu would come out of the house of Aisha radiallahu anha, and he would stand on the musalla, on the sajada, and he would turn around, and he would say, straighten your saf. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, the Ashra Mubashara, the people of Badr, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam radiallahu anhum. Can you imagine that Salah? Let me tell you about the Salah even better than that. Let's go back to Al-Aqsa. When Allah says, Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-Aqsa. Pure is that being who took his slave, the Messenger of Allah, from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. Now imagine this Salah. The Prophet Sallallahu turns around and he says, straighten your safs. It's not Abu Bakr and Umar, it's Ibrahim Alayhi Salatu Salaam. It's Yusuf, it's Yunus, it's Musa, it's Yaqub Alayhi Salatu Salaam. Never has there been a Salah recorded which is more Mubarak than the Salah that the Prophet Sallallahu led in Masjid Al-Aqsa. 124,000. Anbiya alayhi salatu salam. You go to Masjid Al-Aqsa, literally anywhere that you will do sajda, a Nabi would have done sajda in that place. If, if there was no other virtue of Masjid Al-Aqsa, that would suffice. That you would have the honor of walking in the same place where all the Anbiya alayhi salatu salam, from Adam to Muhammad alayhi salatu salam walked. So Umar now finishes his salah and he turns around and he begins to cry. And they said, Amir al muminin what are you crying for? This is a joyous occasion. This is what an occasion. You have fulfilled the prophecy of the message of Allah. You have taken the masjid created by Sulaiman alayhi salatu salam. Umar radiallahu anhu said, I know. You don't need to tell me that. But what concerns me is that the words of the Prophet sallallahu when he climbed on the pulpit and he said, it is not shirk that I fear for you, but is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the dunya for you. And you compete in the dunya like those who competed before you. And the dunya destroys you like it destroyed those before you. Omar knew that the Muslims were the dominant power. And then Omar radiallahu anhu finished his salah. And then the patriarch wanted to take Omar radiallahu anhu around Jerusalem. So right next to Masjid Al-Aqsa is the main church of Christendom where they believe that Isa alayhi salatu salam is buried. So he's taking Umar radiallahu anhu around and it's salah time. So he says, Amir al-Mu'minin, don't worry, you can pray salah in the church. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, no, look at the hikmah of Umar. He said, because if I pray salah here, Later, Muslims will say that our Amir al muminin prayed Salah here, therefore this belongs to us. So Umar radiallahu left the church and he prayed outside. And today where Umar prayed, you have the Masjid of Umar is still there. And this is amazing. See the Sunnah of Umar? Come many centuries later, the time of Salahuddin. You had the Crusades, the longest battle in history. It, it lasted over 200 years. So they said to Salahuddin, they said, Oh Salahuddin, look, this is not going to finish. We know a way of finishing this. All you have to do is destroy this church because the Christians believe 
that Isa is buried here, the Christian will stop coming here, and it's not our Aqidah. Our Aqidah is that Jesus is taken to the heavens. Alayhi salatu salam. What did Salahuddin say? He said, I can't do that. He said, why not? He said, because a man greater than me took Jerusalem and he didn't do it, so I can't do it. And then Umar radiallahu stays a few days in Jerusalem and he leaves. And before Umar radiallahu leaves, he says amazing thing. Wallahi, he says, oh Muslims, let me advise you. He said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has fulfilled his promise to you. Meaning that he said that he would give you Jerusalem, he gave you Jerusalem. And he has made you inheritors in the earth. So remain in the state of shukr. For as long as you remain in the state of shukr, Allah will grant you his favors. And he said, never be ungrateful. For when a person begins to sin, he begins to become ungrateful to Allah. And if he does not do tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah removes the honor Allah gave him and Allah places upon his shoulders his enemies. And he will place upon you your enemies and your enemies will disgrace you. Nowhere, wallahi, I say nowhere in the world is there a greater disgrace for the two billion Muslims than Jerusalem? Surrounded by Muslims. And look how Allah has removed the honor. And it's a collective shame. It's not a shame for the Palestinians. Actually, for the Palestinians, far less than anybody else because they're holding the fort. It's a bigger shame for everybody else from the Muslim Ummah.